Okay. So our next speaker is um, James Murphy. He's the head of Reduced Risk Substantiation at the British American Tobacco, develops and assesses novel technologies and oversees preclinical and clinical research, research programs. His team is working on research methodologies to substantiate the reduced risk potential for next generation e-cigarette products. Thank you. I don't think you're Kurt Kistler, though. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, just like to start off by thanking the committee for uh, inviting me here today to talk to you about um, clinical studies that have been conducted uh, with end users. Uh, so, um, my name is James Murphy and uh, I head up our Reduced Risk Substantiation Group, which is really our clinical and non-clinical group. And I'm based in our Southampton uh, R&D on the uh, south coast of England, so just across the pond. <coughs> Uh, so conflict of interest, uh, just to declare that this work was fully funded by British American Tobacco and that uh, myself and my co-workers are full-time employees of British American Tobacco for the duration of the research. So the talk today will uh, focus as follows. Um, I'll just open up by discussing the role that clinical studies play in assessing the uh, risk reduction potential of uh, ends relative to cigarettes. And then the bulk of the talk's really around four areas. So part A will be looking at nicotine exposure. Uh, they go to part B looking at toxicant exposure. C goes into individual risk, and then I finish off with uh, population risk and a little summary. OK, so we recently published our uh, assessment framework for uh, substantiating the risk reduction potential uh, of uh, ENDS. And this here framework comprises uh, preclinical, clinical, and uh, population research. And clinical studies are absolutely fundamental to, uh, to these types of frameworks. Um, we need things like pharmacokinetic studies to look at nicotine uptake um, and nicotine exposure. We need biomarkers of exposure studies to look at uh, toxin exposure. Uh, individual risk requires biomarkers of potential harm to assess the potential long-term long um, harmful effects. Um, population risk will look at uh, population modelling, which will require a clinical study to give you the uh, risk estimates to fit into the population uh, models. So just to start off, and so we've touched on some of this today so already, so I don't need to talk about this for too much, but um, <clears throat> these were two studies that I, I picked out uh, to review nicotine exposure. One was from uh, Farslinos in the University of Petras, and the second was from uh, the Dawkins group at uh, London South Bank University. And what's interesting about comparing these two studies is one is a, a user assessment where you've got a single product assessed by two groups, experienced users and naive users. And then you've got a product assessment, a high and a low nicotine e-liquid concentration assessed by experienced users. And really what you see that um, <coughs> the actual nicotine uptake with, with ENDS is dependent on both the uh, experience of the end user. So as they're more experienced, they can adjust their puffing behavior and, uh, and get, um, get more nicotine uptake and um, also the product performance with the higher nicotine loading uh, compounds giving, uh, giving more nicotine. We uh, recently com completed over the last couple of years two um, pharmacokinetic studies looking at nicotine exposure and um, they were interesting uh, in terms of the fact that we used naive end users, so a study based in the UK in study one, and then more experienced end users in a study uh, based in the, uh, in the United States. And as you can see from the first study, when we give uh, naive users um, a, an, e an ENDS and a cigarette, that the nicotine uptake was much greater with uh, the cigarette in comparison to the ENDS. However, when we went to the, uh, to the US <coughs> and we gave the same product to, um, to experienced users, they were able to modify their behavior and get uh, a substantially greater nicotine uptake with the ENDS, almost comparable with the, uh, with the cigarette um, uh, product. So moving on to toxin exposure, so I talked a little bit about how puffing behaviour is important for understanding uh, PK studies and, and nicotine exposure. It's also very important for establishing machine puffing regimes, which has been the subject of a couple of talks today already. And uh, we've done a, a couple of studies now, we've looked at our own products, uh, E-Pen, E-Tank, E-Box, these, so E-Pen's a low, a low wattage closed modular ends, E-Tank's a low wattage open tank ends, and the E-Box is a high wattage open tank ends. And we looked at the uh, puffing behaviour with each of these three products and we could see that in each of the case <coughs> the uh, puff, um, puff volume was, was uh, around about sort of 50, 55 mils. The duration was somewhere between sort of 1.5 and just over 2 and the interval was around about 30. So 
These were quite in line with the uh, Caresta uh, recommended method, uh, which stipulates a, a 35 mil puff volume, three second puff duration, and 30 second interval between the puffs. And it's really important that we are able to use a regime in our preclinical studies that then fits with our uh, human studies. So just moving a bit, uh, bit further down, down the chain of uh, how um, does puffing regimes um, impact the chemistry. So here I've just got a, a brief overview of um, a cigarette in comparison to an end and a lot of the stuff you've heard about today already. And just some of the key takeaways here are if you look at uh, a cigarette, you know, the combustion of tobacco generates over 7,000 compounds. From our studies, our untargeted studies so far, we've seen that ENDS products typically have about somewhere between the region of 10 to 100 compounds in the aerosol. Look at the number of toxin types, you have 100 to 150 in cigarettes with less than 5 in, in ENDS. Uh, the HPHC formation mechanisms are well known in cigarettes as transfer from tobacco and it's also the power of synthesis of some of these compounds into smoke. Uh, in ENDS, it's things like the uh, poorly stewarded e-liquids, so liquids that contain contaminants, carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, thermal degradation, extra e and Ls, we, talk, we heard about that uh, earlier on. And the two images here just reflect uh, what is a GCGCMS um, snapshot of the aerosol. So the top one is a snapshot of cigarette smoke and you can see the complexity of the uh, smoke with the vast array of uh, number of peaks. Where the bottom image just um, is a snapshot of the ENDS aerosol, which is a much simpler um, aerosol. Okay, so moving on, we uh, looked at some uh, target analysis of uh, toxicants relative to uh, biomarkers of exposure. Uh, this is a paper we published um, last year. <coughs> uh, we looked at over 100 uh, individual compounds from our EPEN device, and we could see that typically uh, the levels of these here constituents in uh, the ENDS um, vapour in comparison to cigarette smoke was, was about 1 to 2 percent. So a huge uh, reduction in number of uh, levels of, of these toxins in, um, uh, in, in, in ENDS aerosol. Um, so just going a little bit further on to uh, toxin exposure, so some of the studies that have been conducted to date um, on biomarks of exposure. So we, we heard our earlier about the Roswell Park study. I think another, another study which uh, would be interesting for the committee to uh, consider is a, a study from Fontaine Ventures, which is um, a uh, wholly owned subsidiary from Imperial Tobacco Group where they looked at uh, solus end use, dual use and continued cessation and from their study they could conclude that solus end use was giving reductions in uh, biomarks of exposure similar to cessation and like we talked about earlier on today, uh, dual use uh, did not achieve those, uh, those same levels of reductions as, uh, as solus use. And again just a, a nod to the recently published study uh, sponsored by Cancer Research UK, which has extended a study out to six months and found uh, quite similar uh, information. Okay, so um, just to summarise this little section on uh, toxic and exposure. So this is the type of study design that we would um, recommend. Typically a five-day randomised force switch confinement study, typically 30 uh, subjects per arm. And if you look at the, the table, we would uh, recommend three arms of uh, continued cigarette smoking, switch from cigarette to ends, and then cigarette to cessation, and then sampling um, the, um, uh, the subjects uh, over, over time. Moving into individual risks, so just to set some foundations, um, we've done uh, one of these types of studies um, a number of years ago on a reduced toxin prototype cigarette. In those studies, we took a cigarette, we modified the blend and the filter of the cigarette with toxin reducing technologies. And we were able to deliver substantial reductions in particulate and gas phase, not to the same level as ENDS, but at the time substantial in comparison to a, a, a normal cigarette. Um, this next point is, is very important, taking into account one of the um, questions from the, uh, the committee earlier on on dose response, where we actually saw really significantly reduced levels of biomarkers of exposure uh, in comparison of the RTP cigarette, so that's the blue line, in comparison to the, um, the controlled cigarette, which is the, the upper red line. However, whenever we look at these two products uh, for biomarkers of potential harm, we actually found that there was uh, little or no change in those biomarkers. So that's why it's really important to understand um, the dose response uh, for these types of products. So, um, in, those, in that study, uh, we, we studied uh, six different uh, biomarks potential harm. 
These, we would still recommend using these types of biomarkers. They are well established in uh, smoking and cessation studies. <coughs> and these, uh, when we move on to our types of studies, these are exactly the type of uh, biomarkers that we will look at. However, with the advances of some of the modern sciences, especially in the area of omics, we do feel that there is some real value in, um, in using some of these omic endpoints for our, uh, our BOPH analysis. So one study uh, we did recently was uh, looking at proteomics. So we took sputum samples from smokers and non-smokers. We analysed them via LCMSMS. And then we were able to see there was about 11, 111 uh, proteins that were specific to smokers relevant to non-smokers and these here would be I think very very good candidates to look at uh, in a biomarker potential harm study. Um, then the study design for um, an individual risk study would um, we believe look something like this so typically 60 subjects per arm to give sufficient power to the endpoints um, and the arms that we would look at would be if you look in the uh, table so the first arm would be a non-smoking arm being sampled at the uh, baseline and at six months we would then have a switch arm that would uh, move cigarette smokers to ends, and then we would have a cessation arm. <clears throat> Within the cessation arm, we imagine there are three scenarios would play out. So there would be uh, there's some subjects who would continuous quit over the, uh, the period of the study, some who would dual use, and some who would relapse and make up a, a smoking arm. And we think that by <clears throat> monitoring uh, the subjects in this type of study would give us the um, uh, the information to understand um, the ability of ENDS to impact on uh, risk reduction by comparing it against the, um, uh, the cessation arm. We would uh, initially plan the study to be a 12-month study, but we'd put a six-month stop uh, with the Data and Safety Monitoring Board to evaluate the results at that time to see if we saw the, um, uh, the changes that were required to uh, assess the um, uh, risk reduction potential of ENDS. Um, that's the, the data sets from exposure and, and reduction clinical studies are absolutely fundamental for enabling us to make um, uh, excess risk uh, estimates and these would be taken from our preclinical but especially our clinical uh, studies. Um, the risk estimates would be required for smoking, for solus end use, for dual use you know, in respect of um, uh, <coughs> never smokers and, and NRT. We would then uh, need to sample the population and see the percentage of people who were smoking, solus end use, dual use, non-smokers and quitting. And then we could put that into a dynamic model uh, to assess the population um, risk impact. Um, so just a couple of slides on, on, the, um, on the modelling we've done so far. So uh, we've calibrated our model uh, against the UK Office of National Statistics on um, the UK population over the next uh, 30 years and we can see that there's actually very good correlation with our model with the ONS projection. Now when we use the model then to um, model the percentage of smokers in the UK we can run two scenarios. One we can look at the status quo which is just uh, cigarettes in the marketplace which is the, uh, the upper line and then a counterfactual where it ends are introduced into the marketplace and you can see that then the percentage of smokers in the UK will reduce as ends are introduced and, and get uptaken in the, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, furthermore, we can then look at uh, population risk. So what we can do here is use our excess risk estimates. So in this case, we have uh, assumed uh, an ENDS excess risk of 0 0.05 of uh, cigarette smoking. We took that their number based on public health uh, findings in the UK. We also, other assumptions where we assumed that uh, dual user um, excess risk would be that, the same as a cigarette smoker and that relapsers um, would lose any reduction on, on ER as well. So whenever we plug those values into our population model, <coughs> you can see the bottom line is that actually over time you will start to see uh, a reduction in the percentage of smokers, uh, smoking related mortality uh, to people on, um, under 75. Now, this... Uh, this model is using estimates which I believe are, are quite conservative, so we really need to understand dual users and relapsers uh, over time, and I think that's where the clinical studies play a fundamental uh, role to be able to refine and improve those uh, excess risk estimates. Um, the second part of population risk could be looking at um, some monitoring uh, studies in post-market surveillance. So in that respect, we would recruit and track smokers who have uh, used ENDS over, say, 18 to 36 months. Then we would look at subject monitoring and self-reported questionnaires. And things that could be important would be things we've discussed today, would be things like monitoring adverse events, 
you know, over time, is there actually a reduction or a reversal of the disease symptoms? Uh, is there an improvement in uh, quality of life? And uh, previously, with our uh, reduced toxin prototype cigarette <coughs> studies, we um, <coughs> co-developed with John Ware a, a tea quality tool, so a tobacco quality of life impact tool that I think may have merit in uh, assessing uh, quality of life and also looking at things like reductions in, uh, in, in health visits with, uh, with subjects. So just in summary, um, so we've established a framework for assessing the, the risk reduction potential of ENDS. Uh, we believe the clinical studies are fundamental to understanding ENDS exposure and risk. From the studies we've uh, published to date, we've seen substantial uh, reduction in targeted uh, emissions, so harmful and potentially harmful constituents for ENDS versus cigarettes. Uh, studies show that exposure reductions occur with end use in comparison to cigarettes and also we've seen some initial studies focused on health outcomes that show that uh, risk reduction uh, in ends is possible. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. So are, are there questions? Thank you very much. You didn't mention too much about metals. Have you done any analysis of metals and potential? You mentioned about leakage of, uh, of the, from the device to the liquid, but yeah. could you yeah, uh, In that uh, paper we published, um, uh, Chemistry, Research and Toxicology, we, uh, we assessed, we assessed uh, I think it was seven or eight metals in the, uh, in the aerosol. So that, those, that data is in that publication. Yeah, I, um, I, th I don't believe that we actually were able to quantify metal levels in, um, in, in the analysis that we did with, the, with our product that we analysed. So one quick question. Your proteomics data, did yep. you uh, do any further analysis like uh, pathway analysis, any cellular event or adverse outcome pathway that was generated from that subsequent analysis, assuming that you did it? Yeah, I mean, um, my colleague Mariana is going to speak in about uh, three presentations time, so she'll be touching on some of that there stuff. Um, what we did as well, we, we ran a, um, an in vitro program in, 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 in parallel to the, uh, the clinical studies to see if we could actually integrate the results from in vitro to the, uh, the clinical study, and there's, there seemed to be very good overlap between the two data sets.